as we say our opening prayer. If you'll join me with the words that appear in yellow on the screen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to remember that you are here with us. May we pray to you in faith, sing your praise with gratitude, and listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So without uh, shaking hands, but only using your Bluetooth elbows, and without moving around the congregation, why don't you elbow the people around you and uh, give them a greeting. Uh, for those outside, the volume is already at as loud as I can get it. Uh, apologies. Um, I hope that it will improve, but that's as loud as it goes, and if there's uh, issues, we'll try and fix that. Hopefully it's audible on Facebook, and we can record that later. Uh, so now during the singing of songs, we're not supposed to sing uh, in the congregation, so I invite you to just hum the songs in your hearts. Um, the doctors have told us that if we sing uh, with our masks on, we'd have to have about tenth of the people in the congregation because actually when you sing you blow quite a lot of air out and it comes out the sides of your masks. So we just have to be cautious there. Today our theme is about salvation and uh, we're looking at Psalm 51 verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And this is our theme for, for Lent. And so we've looked at restore and joy and this week salvation. Before I spoke the word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took the breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me.
listen to the words of Psalm 51 from verses 1 to 10 and I'll be reading from the message version of the Bible and uh, so the words will sound a little different to what we used to but sometimes hearing the words differently helps us to hear them anew. Generous in love, God, give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt, soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. You're the one I've violated, and you've seen it all seen the full extent of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step with you for a long time, in the wrong since before I was born. What you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me then. Conceive a new, true life. Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me and I'll have a snow white life. Tune me in to foot tapping songs. Set these once broken bones to dancing. Don't look too close for blemishes. Give me a clean bill of health. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from grey exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. Give me a job teaching rebels your ways so the lost can find their way home. Commute my death sentence, God, my salvation God. And I'll sing anthems to your life-giving ways. Unbutton my lips, dear God. I'll let loose with your praise. Going through the motions doesn't please you. A flawless performance is nothing to you. I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. Heart shattered lives ready for love. Don't for a moment escape God's notice. Make Zion the place you delight in. Repair Jerusalem's broken down walls. Then you'll get real worship from us. Acts of worship small and large including all the fools they can heave onto your altar. Amen. Thanks be to God. Loving Lord Jesus, as we come to praise you and worship you, we come also to confess for the right roads we avoid in travelling and the kindly words we refuse to share for the false gods who received our worship and the true selves we have starved of love. God, by your grace, forgive us. For the hidden hurts we have held too tightly, and the promises which we never kept. For the careless use of our time and money, and the lame excuses we should never have made. God, by your grace, forgive us. For all we should be and all we can amend, God, in your love, renew us. For all you have in store for us and all you may demand of us, God, in your love, prepare us. For the life of the world and the love of its people, God, in your love, commit us. Here, and believe these words of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. And listen to him as he calls to you, saying, Come and follow me. And so we celebrate. Glory to the Creator who gives us life. Glory to Jesus whose love remakes us. Glory to the Spirit, companion on our journey. Glory be to God. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer as Jesus has taught us to pray in the language of our hearts as we say together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> I have to apologize because my voice is not used to speaking loudly so people can hear me. I'm used to speaking quietly into a microphone and that seems to make me cough. <laughs> Welcome. We listen to Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, we pray. Amen. So we're continuing to reflect on that verse of Psalm 51. Am I in there? We shouldn't normally move seats, but I'm going to have to keep looking around the iPad to see you. Can you? Yeah, sorry. I just feel like I'm leaving you out. Thanks, ma'am. We're reflecting on the words of David in Psalm 51 verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And so on Ash Wednesday we, we remembered what it means to be called to repent. And the tradition of ashing our foreheads is a tradition of saying that we are sinners, that we are mortal, that we trust in God, that we turn away from our sins. But we also remembered the, the power of the prophecy of John the Baptist who said that one comes after me who will baptize you with fire. And that fire baptism of the Holy Spirit is the purifying and refining fire that the Holy Spirit offers to transform us and change us and renew us. And so David prays, restore, which is a bit like repent, but instead of saying to somebody else, repent, he is praying, Lord, turn me around. Lord, it's something that we can only do with God's grace and help. And so we turn to the joy of your salvation. So last week, and it seems strange to talk about joy at a time like Lent when we think of ourselves as, <clears throat> as kind of being penitential and, and suffering for our sins. But this is what God wants for us. God wants us to have blessedness, to have happiness according to God's definition of happiness and not according to our definition of happiness. And so David chose to find immediate satisfaction in using his power to take advantage of Bathsheba and to get rid of Uriah the Hittite. In all of that he found nothing but sadness. And so if we find joy in our own selfish pleasures, 
we ruin our lives. But when we find joy in the blessedness of following Jesus, we have true joy. And that's what God wants for us. And so the words that Jesus says, blessed are the poor, and we say, how can the poor be blessed? Blessed are those who mourn, and we say, how can those who mourn be blessed? We know that they are blessed because they are being true to themselves. They are probably poor because they are sharing what they have with those in need. They are mourning because they see the sadness and the brokenness of the world and it bothers them. We allow ourselves to become hardened to the reality of the brokenness of the world. We're blessed when we mourn. We're blessed when we long for the Kingdom of God. Because God will turn things around. God's salvation plan is in effect. So we can sing with Mary and with Hannah. Mary, when Jesus is going to be born, He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Hannah, when Samuel is to be born, He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ashy to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honour. And so David longs for the joy of God's salvation. So we've gone through, repent, restore, joy, and now salvation. And Christians are interesting because we think that everybody understands what we're talking about when we say, is that <laughs> The sound system strange. It went off now, hey? Can you still hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay. Sound system's having its own fun today. Christians are strange when we talk about uh, being saved, you know? Because if you went to somebody and you said, Are you saved? They would say, From what? Saved from? Or what are you saved for? What do you save toward? I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to have to speak even louder. Just watch Grant that he's not. <laughs> just uh, join us in a second. I'm just going to press a button on the on the on the mixing desk. <laughs> Da -da -da -da. Mm. Okay, that's better. Sorry for leaving you on the Facebook and in the car. It's funny when you can't see what's happening in here. Hey? Anyway, what do we mean when we say we're saved? What are you saved from? And what are you saved for? And so as soon as we ask the question, what are you saved from? Most Christians would answer, we're saved from hell. And then you'd have to ask more questions like, what is this hell you're talking about, etc. And the problem is that our Christianity has become parched of its truth by an emphasis on saying that you need to be saved from hell, you need to turn or burn. The street preacher who warns you that there's a fire waiting to burn your toes if you misbehave once. Because salvation is about so much more than about being saved from hell. It's about what you're saved for. And even if you ask David in his time, what is salvation? The first answer that David would give you is, I've been saved from slavery in Egypt. We celebrate that at Passover every year as we remember how God saved us from oppression and brought us into freedom. If you pressed him further, he would say, I've been saved from my enemies who tried to kill me. They chased me and tried to bring me down, but God saved me. 
If you asked him even more, he'd say, I've been saved from my addiction to sin. God has saved me from my desire to satisfy myself with needs that, that I know aren't the needs that need satisfying. We're saved from so much more than just the notion of a punishment in the future. In fact, hell, or any idea of that, would not have featured in David's answers. His concept of salvation had to do mostly with what God saves us for, and not with what God saves us from. So I invite us as we fast this week towards a better understanding of salvation, is to repent of thinking of what we are turning from and turn towards thinking about what we are turning toward. Ask ourselves the question, not what God has saved us from, but what has God saved us for? What is the purpose of my life? What is God turning me around for? What does God want to use me for? What is the purpose of my life? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 10 is a classic set of verses about what salvation is. And it comes to the conclusion describing what we are saved for. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You are saved, and we'll get to more understanding of what it means to say saved or salvation, to be set free to do what you were called to do, to reveal your purpose in the world. As David prays, he says, save me, restore the joy of my salvation, and I will teach sinners your ways. He's saying that I'm you saved me and now I will go and share this joy I have with others of what you have done. I'll become somebody who fishes for people who are drowning, who rescues them out of the brokenness of the world. You are saved to fulfill God's true purpose in your life. And when it says we are God's workmanship, it deliberately doesn't say we are God's creation or something small. The word for poem comes from that Greek word workmanship. And when you write a poem, you don't just sit and throw a few words down. You choose every letter and every punctuation mark and every word carefully and craftily in order to convey an important meaning in what you are saying. God has labored delicately over every part of you to create you for his purpose so that in salvation you can reveal his glory. God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We read in John chapter 1 verse 3 that all things were made through Jesus. In his making of us we are purposeful for goodness or good works. We're reminded that creation, the, the fingerprints, the, the handprints of God on creation, created for goodness and not for badness. And we are created for God's goodness. But thinking about hell, we realize that sometimes we create our own hell on earth. I was touched by Corrie Tim Worm's uh, writing, and I just can't remember the name of the book, but she writes of her experience at the prisoner of war camp at Ravensbrook and God's sustaining presence. She says, I have experienced his presence in the deepest hell that man can create. A reminder that in our evil, we are sometimes quite capable of creating hell for others. In Ephesians, Paul writes, verses 1 to 2, Although you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. If you're going through life like a zombie, dead in your trespasses and sins, you end up creating hell for other people. I've met so many people abused by their employers who come home crying every night and then they take out that anger and that hardened heart on, on the people around them at the end of the day. Hitler and many of his soldiers believed that they were actually Christian. And yet in their cruel ways they managed to create hell for so many people that they considered enemies. If you look at the hell that we create with our society, the way that people live in the cold and in the rain and, and starving and desperate for some resources, we realize that we have created through our own selfishness a kind of hellish existence on earth. Because we simply walk as Paul says, according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. We can create a hell, a living hell for people around us without bullying, without teasing, with our lack of generosity and our selfishness, with our unfaithfulness, with our addictions and our insecurities. With emotional and physical abuse, we create hell for other people. And we actually suffer in ourselves, although we don't realize it because we've become so numb. We don't see the damage we are doing because we simply go with the flow, dead in our trespasses and sins, like zombies. Going through life, joyless, lifeless not giving life, not doing good, not being a positive person for the world that we live in. Finding some fleeting pleasure in the latest thing we bought, in the latest experience we had, looking for joy at the bottom of the bottle, getting high, and the thrill of doing things without taking care of the consequences. Simply creating a chaotic hell for those around us. So we start to understand what, what hell is. Paul writes, We were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. And this is where we start to talk properly about an idea of something that we could call hell. Not as an arbitrary consequence of believing the right thing or saying the right prayer, but as receiving the punishment that we deserve for the pain that we have caused. I shudder to think, if I think of a just punishment for my sins, that a just punishment would be that I would experience in myself all the pain that I have caused through my unjust way of living. If I were to experience in myself all the hurt that I have caused with my careless words, my ugly behaviour, all the fear, all the anxiety, all the suffering. If all of that could be reflected into me for me to experience, there would be nothing unjust about that. It would be fair that I would receive in myself the punishment for my sins. God's wrath is not some unrivaled, evil, chaotic rage of someone destroying everything in their path. But the wrath is the consequence of our actions. We get to that point where we realize that we deserve what could come to us. But then we hear these words of grace, and I just love it when a word starts, when a verse starts with, but God. This is where we hear the word of grace, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, transformed from being zombies without life, from being joyless and hopeless in the world, 
to being full of life and full of joy and full of love and not just that kind of joy that is joy of receiving pleasure from the moment but that true and deep joy that comes from following God that joy of blessedness he made us alive he gave us joy and I love the way Paul sort of says just in a in a in an outburst by grace you have been saved so when we say we're saved we're saying we've been made alive to the fact of our sin and our brokenness and we've been transferred transferred to a new life of hope and joy with God we have also been raised up with him into the heavenly places in Christ Jesus remember that Christ was raised up and if we remember that Christ was raised up we remember that Christ died and so if you think of the lifesaver going out into the breakers to save the drowning person it's as if the lifesaver goes out to die to bring the drowning person back alive Christ has died for us in a sense jumping into the water with us to save us he's embraced us and rescued us and God has raised us up with him Christ identified with us in our death he took us into his embrace and his arms and he rose again lifting us up above all of that stuff that we spoke about at the beginning dead in our trespasses and sins walking according to the course of this world according to the ruler of the authority of the air we've been lifted up from that point where we were victims of our sinful nature to the point where we have victory over our sinful nature in Christ who has raised us up we're saved from being those dead and lifeless zombies we're saved from the wrath that we deserve for the actions that we committed in that state Christ has died for us Christ has died with us and we have been raised with him to new life and so as we reflect this week ahead on the joy of your salvation I invite us to think Yes, what have we been saved from? Maybe we need to be aware of what we still need saving from. Maybe we have bad habits that hurt others and create hell on earth by this. But maybe we also need to be liberated towards the good that God has created us for. So that we go out and create the kingdom of God here in this place. Let us pray. Restore to us, O Lord, the joy of your salvation. Thank you that we can celebrate what it means to be saved. Saved from ourselves. Saved from our selfishness. Saved from being zombie-like in our lives, going through life only considering our own pleasures and our own desires and needs. Thank you that you come along and you teach us how to live and how to love. How to live outside of our own interests and into yours. That you teach us how to be truly blessed as we share what we have with others. As we mourn for the brokenness of the world and we long for the coming of your kingdom and thirst and hunger for your righteousness. So fill us with faith to know that your will will be done, that your kingdom will come. And so, Lord, we pray for the world in which we live. You'll join me for words in yellow. Having heard your word proclaimed to us, we dedicate ourselves to you, 
Strengthen us by your Spirit to do your will, and bring us with all your saints to the glory of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear us, O Lord, as we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Make us all one, that the world may believe. Lord, as we sit here and as we think about our church throughout the world and throughout the neighbourhood, God, that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that the life of Christ may be revealed in us. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen all who minister in Christ's name. Give them courage to proclaim your gospel. At this difficult time, as we face a terrifying pandemic, as the economies of the world are are exasperated and broken. We ask that you would inspire and lead those who hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide them and all people in the way of justice and peace. Lord, at this time when we've been so isolated from the people around us, we sometimes don't notice their needs. So even through social media and WhatsApp and phone calls and however else we are able to stay in touch. We ask that you would make us alive to the needs of our community. Help us to share each other's joys and burdens. And Lord, at this time especially, we ask that you would look with kindness on our homes and families. Grant that your love may grow in our hearts. And Lord, as we become hardened by the brokenness of things around us, Soften us and inspire us to have compassion on those who suffer from sickness, grief or trouble. In your presence may they find their strength. Remember at this time those who have died. Father, into your hands we commend them. The Lord, we praise you for all your saints who have entered your eternal glory Bring us all to share in your heavenly kingdom. Amen. Invite us in this moment of silence to lift up our silent prayers for those around us as we give thanks and pray. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. We pray you to accept and answer our prayers, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing in our hearts, Amazing Grace. Ooh. Mm -hmm. 
understand as we share the grace with one another and as we pray for each other as we go from here. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world, so that we can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. Amen. And I know that Methodists never know how to leave unless we say the words that we're so familiar and we can say them in our language. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. So if you're sitting in your car, you can make your way past the drive through at uh, Burger King or McDonald's and buy yourself some coffee. If you're here, just stick around for a minute so we can talk about our duties in terms of uh, um, the COVID readiness and COVID reopening. And if you're at home, please move to your kitchen and make yourself some tea and some coffee and enjoy it for us. God bless and have a lovely Sunday afternoon.